So hello everyone, my name is Zach Kraus. Thank you for signing up for this course, Crash Course on Climate Change and Sustainability. I invite you to, but do not require you to turn your cameras on if you wanna make it feel a little more interactive. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Let's see, first, who am I? I graduated from Cornell in 2019. I'm wearing my shirt from when I taught Splash at Cornell. I don't know if some of you may have been there because it was only two years ago and you may have seen me in my fancy cloud suit. I studied meteorology at Cornell and I minored in climate change and applied economics. I'm now getting my master's in environmental management. I also work as a meteorologist, a substitute teacher, and um, just generally love educating people. On the side, I am a DJ. I want to know where you're from because climate change has various impacts that change based on where you are in the world. So I wanna be able to customize what I'm talking about. So let's use this poll to see where everybody is from and let's get people starting to interact. So if you have your a phone or an iPad with you, let's see if we can get this poll working. Awesome, so we got some results pouring in. We're basically on the West Coast or the Northeast with one person in the dead center. So that can help us guide what we're talking about. There's definitely a lot of you that are impacted by wildfires over there on the West Coast, more on the West Coast than I would expect. All right, let's keep going. We'll do some more polls throughout. So what are we gonna do today? We're going to set up an ex a hands-on experiment um, sorry that the email came late. I sent it on Thursday and it bounced back and I had to send it again this morning. So we're gonna set up an experiment and then we're gonna talk about the science of climate change. Then we're gonna talk about two modes of fixing climate change. Then we'll return to our experiment and then we'll conclude. So let's set up this experiment that we're gonna come back to later. Oh, before we set that up, I just wanna say it's summer and I get it and I appreciate and don't take for granted that you guys are choosing to spend your Saturday with me. And I wanna um, try to make it as engaging as possible. Okay. I hope that some of you, give me, a, give me like a thumbs up or a message in the chat if you brought these, ingredient, these uh, supplies. or just call out. You can chime in at any time. Did anybody get a chance to bring these supplies? If not, it's okay. So we want two glasses, clear glasses filled with about three inches of water. And then four ice cubes, three pencils. If you have the supplies, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take a ruler and you're gonna measure the height of the water in the first glass. Mark down the starting height of the water in this glass. And then we're going to take two pencils and place it across the top of that glass. On top of those pencils, we're gonna balance two ice cubes. Like that, okay? Once you get them balanced, they should stay. And then in the other glass, we're going to measure the starting height again. And in that glass, we're just gonna put two ice cubes inside. So we measured the starting height of both. What's important is on the second glass, actually, you're gonna measure the starting height after you put the ice cubes in the glass. So for the first one, we measured our starting height. Then we balanced two ice cubes on the top, on top of the pencils. And then the second one, we dropped two ice cubes in, and then we measured our starting height. And we will come back to this later. Does anybody have questions while setting that up? Okay. 
We're now going to talk about the science of climate change. This is probably the biggest graph in climate change. This is called a key, the Keeling curve, named after the scientists who discovered it. So this graph measures the, the amount of carbon dioxide, CO2, in the atmosphere in parts per million over time, starting around 1955 till around 2020. Do you notice that it's going up or down? Put up or down in the chat. Up. Thank you. So it's going up. Carbon dioxide has gone up over time. But is it going up steadily or does it have these intra-annual variations where it goes up then down, up then down, up then down. Does anybody have any ideas what could be causing that? Why does it go up and down on a yearly basis, but it's going up on average over time? Let's see what you guys think about that. I'm loving the ideas that are coming in the chat. That's fine. That thank you for putting that in the chat, Daniel. So we're looking for what causes these up and downs on a yearly basis, even though it's going up over time. All right, we have five results so far. Let's see if we can get a few more people to answer the question. Six, seven, eight. Nine. All right, let's see what people are thinking. Okay, so we have about a quarter of us saying variations in solar activity, then about half saying seasonal variations in tree foliage, and then about another 40% saying changes in human factor activity throughout the year. So let's see, variations in solar activity is not gonna be our answer because solar activity doesn't vary on a yearly basis on a cycle like this. It's, it's more random and it's not on a 365 day cycle. Changes in human factory activity throughout the year is not the correct answer because we don't vary um, in a cycle like this and summertime heat nobody picked. So the correct answer is seasonal variations in tree foliage, which is what's causing this. Let me go back to the bigger graph. So what's happening is during the summertime in the Northern hemisphere, all of the trees are in bloom, the spring and the summer and trees absorb carbon dioxide. So when the trees are in bloom in the, in the summer, in the, northern, in the Northern hemisphere, they're absorbing carbon dioxide. And that's at these, these low points on this graph. And then during the, the winter, that's these high points when the trees are not absorbing carbon dioxide. And the reason we're focusing on the seasons in the Northern hemisphere is because the Northern Hemisphere has much more land than the Southern Hemisphere. So its seasons and tree foliage variations outweigh what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere because it has so many more trees on average. So that's a little cool fact, but the takeaway here is that it's going up on average. Carbon dioxide is going up. So we know that carbon dioxide is going up. 
and we know that global temperature is going up. We want to see if we can connect those two. Let's first take a look at global temperature over time. So what's in this, this video helps to convey increasing temperature in a very interesting manner. I was in a class with Professor Scott St. George in the geography department, and at one point he posted a slide advertising for interns in his dendrochronology lab, and I was lucky enough to, to get that job. He came to me with a set of data with the task of turning it into a piece of music, and we wound up with a song of our warming planet. In the piece of music, each, each note will correspond to a year and then the pitch of that note will represent the temperature of that year. So then these really high pitches, that would mean a warmer year, and then the lower pitches would be a cooler year. The data comes from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies at NASA. It's a compilation of global annual surface air temperatures. Climate scientists have a standard toolbox to communicate their data. What we're trying to do is we're trying to add another tool to that toolbox, another way to communicate these ideas to the people who might get more out of this than out of maps, graphs, and numbers. Climate change is a defining issue of our generation, and it's still something that a lot of people don't fully understand. And what we're trying to do is to represent the music, sort of the immediacy and the importance that this issue has right now. And if we act on that, then maybe it won't be as much of an issue for the future. So you're looking at a graph of global temperature anomaly. So zero would be average, and then above it would be an above average. So this would be 0.2 degrees Celsius above average, negative 0.2 would be 0.2 below average, and this is over time. This last thing is really powerful. So what they said here is that by the end of the century, the planet will have warmed so much that the note he would have to play to convey the warming would be beyond the range of human hearing. So this is a really creative and powerful way to convey the warming temperatures our planet is experiencing. Now we wanna think about what's causing this warming because that's the biggest debate. A lot of people will say, sure, the planet's warming, but it's natural, it's caused by this, it's caused by that, it's not human's fault. So let's take a look at this animation. Can I get a thumbs up that you're with me on Bloomsburg Business Week and not on the PowerPoint? 
Thank you. Okay, so what's really warming the world? So this, this first line shows the increase in temperature over time. So that's, that's temperature. Temperature is plus, about plus two degrees hotter in Fahrenheit than it was back then. So let's see, maybe what's warming our world is, hold on, I gotta get the clicking thing working. Okay, so maybe it's a change in Earth's orbit. No, so this is, this is the temperature change that we've experienced based on changes in Earth's orbit, which is about nothing. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down a little bit. This black line down here is average. So if it's not changing in Earth's orbit, maybe it's the sun. So this is changes in solar activity over time. That doesn't get us to the warming we need to be either. It's about negligible. Maybe it's volcanic activity. That doesn't quite get us to where we need to be. Maybe it's the combination of volcanic activity, solar energy, or solar changes, and other natural factors. So these become our natural factors. So maybe natural factors have led to our warming. Not quite. We can see that it has led to a little bit of warming in recent time, but it doesn't get us to this plus two degrees Fahrenheit that we need to be at to match what we've ex what we're observing maybe it's deforestation nope that actually makes us cooler because darker forests absorb sunlight and heat the surface of the earth so fewer trees cool us down so that doesn't get us to the warming we need to be we're trying to see what's causing this warming is it ozone pollution that warms us a little bit Maybe it's aerosol pollution. That actually cools us a lot. Aerosols block out sunlight. So that would cause cooling. So that doesn't get us to the warming that we need to be at. Maybe it's greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. And that actually overshoots the warming that we are seeing. So this is, this is the amount of warming that would be caused by the greenhouse gas change over time. So notice that shows about two and a half degrees hotter and we're at about 1.8. So now maybe let's combine all the things that we just saw. Suspense. <laughs> so when we combine all the things we just saw, it matches almost perfectly to the warming that we've experienced. So when we combined the natural factors like volcanoes and changes in Earth's orbit, and then ozone pollution and deforestation and greenhouse gases, all those things combined got us to where we need to be. But when we didn't add in those greenhouse gases, we were super far off. So the conclusion there is that the increase in greenhouse gases from human activity is the major cause of warming. Does anybody have questions about what we just saw? That's a really powerful animation to dispel certain rumors about why the planet is warming. Okay, why should we care that the planet is warming? Some people may say I live in Canada, and I hate how cold it is, I can't wait for global warming so I can go for a hike during February. Why should we care? We should care because the, the natural impacts of climate change are causing financial impacts. The increase in natural disasters is causing billions of dollars of damage every year. We're having crops loss, which is collapsing agricultural markets, et cetera, and all these financial impacts. We're seeing, seeing real estate damage along the coast, damage to ecosystems and biodiversity. We're losing a lot of um, biological life, health impacts. The World Health Organization estimates that 4.6 million people die each year from getting blocked off from the Zoom thing, from causes directly attributed to air pollution, loss of aesthetic and recreation for us and future generations. 
Over 70% of the world's coral, reef, coral reefs have been lost due to warming, and it's estimated that 99% could be lost by mid-century. So this is just some of the reasons why we should care that the planet's warming, and we should hope that we can fix it. So here's a picture of when I studied abroad in Australia, and I got to go snorkeling at the Great Barrier Reef. That doesn't look like it did in Finding Nemo to me. I was pretty disappointed. This looks pretty pale and gray. It's one cool fish here, but I was, I was awfully disappointed. And that's because of this last fact. Coral reefs are one of the first things to go with warming. All right, so we've got all these things happening, sea level rise, storms, agriculture loss, et cetera, coastal erosion. We can adapt, we can put our houses on stilts, we can move away from the coast. We can do all these things, but is that really a long-term solution? Every time a storm comes, we wanna build higher, et cetera. We wanna be able to fix this. And so this brings us to our two approaches for fixing climate change. I call it, we can fix it at the stem or we can fix it at the flower. Can someone tell me what happens if you pull a weed, but you only pull off the leaf of the weed? the weed will grow back. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Irene. So if we just pull off the leaf of the weed, the weed grows back. So that's gonna be the first approach we're gonna talk about, fixing it at the flower or at the leaf, where it's a fix, but it may not be a long-term fix. And then we're gonna talk about fixing it at the stem. So geoengineering is our fix at the flower or fix at the leaf approach. Have you heard of geoengineering? So about two thirds of you have heard of it have not heard of it, and a third of you have. This is kind of what I was expecting. I was expecting more of you to not have heard of it than have. So let's break down the root of this word. Geo means earth, and engineering means building or changing things. So we're changing the earth. The official definition of geoengineering Geoengineering refers to a set of emerging technologies that could manipulate the environment and partially offset some of the impacts of climate change. So we're manipulating the environment artificially to try to offset some of the impacts of climate change. It's been called other things. Originally, it was called solar radiation management. Then it was called albedo modification. Albedo is how reflective the earth is and more names. They keep changing it because they're looking for the name that sounds least sci-fi and controversial because with these kind of things, it sounded like we were, we were playing God and doing all these crazy things. So they're looking for the name that's most wishy-washy so people try to get, people can get on board. What are some of the, what are some of the strategies out there? So this is just some of them. So let's see, what can we do? We can make artificial trees. We can put reflective rooftops on houses to reflect sunlight away. We can plant additional trees. So that's not an artificial way. That's still geoengineering. Wrap glaciers in high albedo material because we're losing the white ice caps on glaciers and it's becoming rock and that dark rock is absorbing sunlight. So we want to try to put the ice back so we can maybe wrap it in some reflective material. We can pump CO2 down into caves. There are all these different things. We can make scrubbing towers. I, uh, when I was a student at Cornell, we had a visiting lecturer who was working with trying to take carbon dioxide um, exhaust from factories and pump it into beds of algae. And then the algaes can feed on it. And then you can use that algae for animal feed. So there's all these cool and innovative ways. But the leading one, oh, here's one more crazy one. People suggest maybe we should put mirrors into orbit to reflect away the sunlight. The leading one is let's make clouds. 
So that's what these misting vessels are doing. These misting vessels are shooting up saltwater mist into the air to make clouds. And you can also do that with this plane that's up here. This plane is shooting out aerosols to try to make clouds. Why do we want to make clouds? We'll get to that in a second. This is a video, I'm not gonna show the whole video, but um, my friends and I decided we wanted to do the math to see how much could we reduce temperature if we were to force every human to wear aluminum foil as a mandatory dress code. And we were able to reduce temperature by uh, 0.6 degrees Celsius, so it was pretty significant. We don't have time for the, the full video, but our conclusion is that we could reduce temperature by 0.65 degrees Celsius if we forced every human to wear aluminum foil. That is not the leading strategy out there. The leading strategy is let's make clouds. And the idea here is that we see when volcanic eruptions occur, we get these significant drops in temperature up to a degree Celsius, which is huge on, on a global scale. So let's try to simulate these volcanic eruptions on our own by making clouds because clouds reflect sunlight, which can help cool the earth. So this cloud, this is a, a cumulus cloud, is reflecting the sunlight away. You can see my mouse, right? The cloud on the left is a, is a cumulus cloud and it's reflecting the sunlight away. But what's the problem here? This cloud on the right, this stratus high, high up flat cloud is trapping heat. So even though this is the leading strategy, there are still a lot of problems with geoengineering, and that's why it's not being implemented on a global scale. Although some countries in Asia have started to make clouds this summer specifically to help um, reduce drought and try to make it rain. But notice that these high clouds are trapping the heat and these thick clouds are reflecting the heat. So not only will we need to be able to make clouds, we would need to be able to make specific type of types of clouds that reflect the sunlight away from the earth. Aside from those scientific problems, it's also hella expensive and you would need to continually act. So we would have to fly planes on, on probably a monthly basis to make this an effective long-term solution. It also seems sci-fi and it also seems like we're playing God here, that we're adjusting the earth. And that is, that is an interesting um, argument, but my, my answer to that is we were almost playing God then when we caused climate change in the first place. So maybe we have to play God to get out of it. Most experts would tell you that geoengineering will likely have to be a strategy that we use to get us out of this mess, but it can't be the only one. We're kind of too deep to not have to use it, but it won't be the only thing that gets us out. What do you think? Do you think geoengineering should be used in cl combating climate change? Most of you say that it should. Does anybody want to share why they think that? That's OK. All right, so how would we do this? We would fly planes and we would spray sea mist. So we would release aerosols out of planes and we would drive boats through the ocean and spray sea mist into the atmosphere to make these clouds. I thought we could try it. Let's do some geoengineering of our own. So I'm gonna do a demonstration. And the last time I did this demonstration, I soaked my laptop and it crashed. So. If you see me leave the Zoom, that's because it happened again, but I'm gonna to try to avoid that because 
My laptop may be on its ninth life at this point. Okay, so I have a bowl of water here. Everyone's still with me? It's hard to tell with uh, your cameras off. I hope you're, you're still engaged. I have a bowl of water here. And then on my phone, I'm going to pull up, I'm pulling up a light meter. So what this is gonna do, one second. What the light meter is going to do is it's going to detect how much light the phone is receiving through the front camera. It's installing, so let me do that. I thought I had installed it already, but apparently my free trial is over. And then I have an ultrasonic mister. This is going to create mist in this bowl. Okay, so here's my light meter. So right now I didn't press, uh, I didn't tell it to read anything, so it's reading zero. And then when I press this button, it's going to take a reading, so it gets a reading of 315 lux is the unit that it's reading in. So that's what it, that's what we're measuring is we're measuring how much light is the phone detecting. So when I put this into the bowl, it's going to start making clouds above the bowl. Before I do that, I want you to ask, tell me in the chat, do you think that the amount of light the phone's reading from down here on the table, so let's get a starting reading. Our starting reading down here on the table is 339 lux. Do you think that is going to go up or down when I make clouds above the phone using the mister? So let's put up or down in the chat. Do you think once there are clouds formed in the air above the phone, will more light be reaching the phone or, will, or less light? So will the reading go up, down, or stay the same? Less light. We got up, 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 less light, less, down, down. So we have like four, five downs and a few ups. So I think we have about two thirds saying down and one third saying up. So let me, let me get the, uh, the mister powered up and we will see what the conclusion is. All right, so we got a lot of clouds. My laptop's getting soaking wet. Let me take a new reading. Okay, before my laptop crashes because it's so wet, we're down to 313 after I made some clouds. So we saw it go down. Let's see. Let's take a minute to think about that. 
and write why you think it went down in the chat while I dry off my laptop. Why did you think the light reading went down? All right, look at that. Laptop didn't crash this time. Okay, so what we saw was that once I made clouds above the phone, those clouds were reflecting away the sunlight that's coming from that window and coming from the window that's in front of me. So less light was reaching the phone. And that's the general idea behind geoengineering. Some of you said up, and it definitely could have gone up because I can't really control what clouds this thing makes, but the types of clouds it was making because it's close to the phone more closely resembles these lower level clouds that reflect away the sunlight than these higher level clouds that trap the sunlight closer to the phone. So that's why we saw it go down. So that's the general idea behind geoengineering. So we just did some at home geoengineering. Okay, so that was our fixed it at the leaf approach. If we were to make clouds, we would have to continually make clouds. And so that's like the leaf growing back on the weed. We want something that's more of a panacea, something that fixes things for the long term. And geoengineering as an idea can help to help, it can stifle um, politicians' belief that we need to adapt things such as sustainability. Because if we can just do geoengineering, why do we need to act sustainably? But what is sustainability? So sustainability is gonna be our fix it at the STEM approach. What does the word sustainability mean to you? I'm looking for one word answers. There's no right or wrong answer here. Preservation, I like that. Responsible, great. Reuse. Long lasting. See if we can get a few more words. It's okay if you repeat words that were already said by other, other classmates. All right, so we have pressure. That's it. Equilibrium, nice. I like that. Maintain, I really like that. So we have long lasting, responsible, preservation, maintain, equilibrium, reuse. These are all great. And the, the, um, the variation amongst your responses will be a nice segue to what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. First, let's talk about what is sustainability at its core? 
sustainability, the word sustain means to keep things as they are currently. So you want to elongate something, say you're using the sustain pedal on a keyboard. You want to elongate something for as long as possible, keep it in equilibrium. So this brings us to the concept of spaceship Earth. Spaceship Earth is one of the core concepts in sustainability. It's the idea that Earth is this little tiny speck in a giant universe, and we're stuck with the resources we have on our spaceship. Earth is a, effectively a spaceship flying through the universe, orbiting around the sun, and we're stuck with the resources we have. So just as if you were out on a spaceship and you only have those resources, Earth is the same way. So that's the concept of spaceship Earth. So sustainability is trying to make those resources last for as long as possible and keep things on Earth in equilibrium. But as we saw with, your, with the word cloud here, sustainability has many meanings, especially when we put it in context of the environment and trying to address climate change. So this is a little conversation I like to have called the philosophy of sustainability. What climate and environment do we owe future generations? If the word sustainability or the word sustain means to keep things as they are, do we owe the next generation an environment and earth in the same state of being as when you and I received it when we were born from our parents? Or if our parents took say X amount of resources from the earth, do we get to take X amount of resources from the earth and leave it without those resources for the next generation? If our parents took double the amount of resources their parents took, do we get to take double what our parents took? What's fair? Or because now we have more knowledge than the previous generation because of scientific advancements, are we obliged to use that knowledge and leave an even better environment than we inherited it when we were born. Not only equal, but better. Are we obliged to use our knowledge to improve the environment? I'm gonna pause here for a second because I wanna hear what people have to say about this. So take a minute to think about it. Take a minute to think about it. And I'm gonna ask people to unmute and share their thoughts. What environment do we owe the next generation? What state of being of the earth? Who wants to be our brave soul to go first? There's no right or wrong answer here. What climate environment do we owe future generations? There's no definite answer. So here's a mug. In the chat, I want you to say whether you like what this mug says or you don't like what this mug says. So just write like or don't like. Like, like, like very much, like, like. Okay, so it seems everybody likes this mug. So I've seen this slogan on mugs and on signs at climate protests. And I have to tell you, even though I'm gonna be disagreeing, I hate what this mug says. I am all for sustainability. I'm all for protecting the planet but I hate what this mug says because of this word not. This word should be and because of this thing called the triple bottom line. If you take away one thing from this course, I want you to take away this graphic right here, the triple bottom line. This is the idea that sustainability has to address all these three criteria. Something is not sustainable unless at the same time it protects the planet, people, and profit. If a solution is not profitable or economically viable, 
it's not a sustainable solution because it's not something we can maintain over time. So say geoengineering, right now it's too expensive to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We have the technology, but it's too expensive to implement on a large scale. So that's not a sustainable solution because it can't be sustained over time. If there is a solution that protects the planet, it's economical, but it hurts people from a social justice perspective on how it has to be imp implemented, that's not a sustainable solution. So something now like solar power is good for the environment, is now more affordable than using fossil fuels for power. And now it can be done using community solar, where we have solar farms off on a field somewhere and it doesn't have to go on people's houses and ruin aesthetic value or anything. That's a sustainable solution because it addresses all three of these criteria in the triple bottom line. So sustainability has to address all these three criteria, in my opinion, and this is a big concept that's out there, but it doesn't have to be in your opinion. But I believe that if something is going to be sustainable, it has to address all three of these things, otherwise it won't last as a solution. So this interconnectedness is a big idea in sustainability. A true sustainable society is also an interconnected society. So when we talk about sustainable development, we're looking at cities that are interconnected. So they are sensors that are detecting traffic flow, but they're also de detecting flooding. We have sensors on car detecting road temperature. Um, we have a sustainable food system and the waste is being used to fertilize crops and all these interconnected strategies that help to address this interconnectedness of the triple bottom line as well. What does that interconnectedness mean? It means that no matter what you choose to do as a career, you can work in sustainability. You don't have to be a scientist to work in sustainability because of that interconnectedness. You can be an urban planner. You can be a food scientist. You can be an, an economist. You can be a teacher. You can be an engineer, so on and so on. You can be a philosopher based on that discussion we just had. No matter what you do, you can have sustainability be a part of your career. And since careers are a few years down the line, but college is coming up for you, how can sustainability be a part of your college experience no matter what you study? So at, at my school at Cornell, they had a minor, a climate change minor. And the way this minor worked is there was only one required class in the minor, and then there were five electives. Those electives had to come from categories of humans and climate change, science of climate change, and um, other. So things in like humans and climate change, I took a, an environmental psychology class, and I took an energy economics class, science of climate change, I took a climate dynamics class, and an oceanography class, an other class, um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but that's the idea that climate change and sustainability is interconnected, so our studies should be as well. So just because you're not studying a hard science in college doesn't mean you can't take a sustainability class. This semester, my grad school, Millersville University, is offering a class called Eco-Criticism, and that's an English class where you look at how the environment is addressed in works of literature. So there are all these interconnected classes you can take as a college student. And I encourage you, no matter what you're taking, to try to take an elective that would, um, that would fuel your knowledge of climate change or the environment, or to fulfill a requirement using one of those classes. So before we conclude, let's come back to our experiment. I don't know how many of you um, ended up getting the supplies and everything, and that's okay. So let's just have a little discussion. We're gonna talk about sea level rise for a second. Oh, let me address the chat. <laughs> someone, someone changed the mind about their mug and mixed feelings, I like that. Okay. So we're gonna talk about sea level rise. Often people say the cause of sea level rise is melting ice caps or melting ice. There are two different kinds of ice. There's land ice, 
This is the glaciers that are on land. So this ice is on land. And then we have floating icebergs in the sea. Something in the chat. Um, So here's the thought experiment. You're in a bathtub. What happens when you get into the water? The water rises up and could overflow the bathtub. That's because you weren't in the water and then you were in the water. But what if you were in the water? So say this man is sitting in his bath and then all of a sudden his body melted. Would the water level rise? What do you think in the chat? Would, his, would the water level rise if this man melted into the bathtub, if his body suddenly became liquid? It would rise, it would rise, it would not rise, it would rise. I think it would rise, it would overflow, it would rise a little bit. Tubs holding more liquid than before. So the idea here is that the his volume is already in the water, displacing the water. Ignoring the fact that his head is above the water. If his body's already in the water and then it turned to liquid, it wouldn't noticeably um, change the volume of water that's in the bathtub. So let's look at this iceberg. A majority of ice that's floating in the ocean is actually below. So icebergs have a majority of their volume below the surface of the water and just a little bit sticking up top. Additionally, which is denser, ice or water? Let's put that in the chat. Which is denser, ice or water? Water is the correct answer. Water is denser than ice. So when water becomes frozen, it expands. So if this ice is already below the surface of the water and it's taking up room, if it were to melt, it would actually be taking up less room. So melting this block of ice turns a majority of its volume into water. So it ends up taking up less room and then puts the little bit that's above the surface into the water. So it's about a wash. Melting this floating iceberg doesn't really change sea level rise, sea level at all. What does change sea level is melting this land ice. Water that's not yet in the ocean, putting that into the ocean will rise sea level. Does anybody have questions about that? Okay, with that in mind, which cup do you think represents land ice? Which one of our two cups from the beginning, the one that had the ice cubes hovering above it and dripping into the water, or the one that had the ice cubes floating in the water? Which one represents land ice? Cup one, which had the ice cubes on top of the pencils, or cup two? Cup one, cup with the pencils. Cup one. Good, so cup one is our cup that represents the land ice. That has the, the ice cubes above the water. So it's not yet in the ocean 
And as that ice melts, it adds to the volume of water in the ocean versus the ice cubes that were already in the water. Once they melt, their volume was already in the water. So they're representing our sea ice. So how do you expect the height of the water in each cup to change? So what should happen to cup one and what should happen to cup two? And if you didn't bring the materials, you can feel free to do this on, on your own time. So cup one, which is our land ice, what would happen when those ice cubes that were floating above it melted? And then how about the ice cubes that were in cup two? Good, so Daniel has the right idea here. Cup one gets higher because it's representing land ice and that ice is melting into the water from above. And cup two stays the same or gets a little bit lower, maybe from evaporation or from the change in volume of the ice as it melts and turns into a liquid. So we just, we just got to the cause of sea level rise, among other things. The leading cause is melting of land ice into the ocean. So that's just a cool demonstration that works while people are at home and something I wanted to do to try to get people's hands on. Let's go to our conclusion now. So before we conclude, I'm gonna show you this trailer for a movie. My name is My name is Damon, and this is my daughter Velvet. Her major concern right now is the elusive art of sleep direction. But soon, she'll have to face a rapidly deteriorating environment. The ice sheet is now melting faster than the scientists predicted. I think there's room for a different story, a story that focuses on the solutions to some of these problems. So in 2040, what will the world look like for our daughter if we just embrace the best that already exists? Instead of having governments that are reacting to disaster, we need governments and businesses that actually take us off in a different direction. Maybe it's farming, or it can be energy, or it can be housing, or it can be empowering girls. I'd like to see deforestation being stopped. Oh, that would be so cool. That'd be awesome. Just be respectful to Earth. Imagine, Velvet, we've adopted regenerative practices, like phrases, pulling the carbon into the soil and making it healthier. That's right. Yeah. And we can embrace efficient local energy. Bangladesh has five million solar home systems. They have their power in their own hands. This is bringing people together. But here I am seeing an aeroplane that is spewing out carbon. You can't help but be a hypocrite because our entire system is built on fossil fuels. What were you guys thinking? Well, sometimes we weren't. The power of innovation, imagination, creativity, this is within all people. People want to be working on something that they can see is actually helping to regenerate the world. Everywhere you look, you will see incredible reasons for hope. We could be 10 billion people with the protein from marine permaculture alone. Wow. Not only are there so many people who want to take part in telling a new story, we have everything we need right now to make it happen. What's your 2040? I just want to say you to be good. Why do I want to end with this? This clip helps to get across the idea that climate change should not be looked at as a, only a burden that our generation has to address. It's also the opportunity for you and me and everybody else in our generation to actually be a real life hero. Not every generation has the opportunity to change the world on a global scale, but we are here tasked with the, tasked with the um, requirement to fix it, otherwise face dire consequences. And it's almost empowering that we have the ability to be a hero, just like Greta here, 
and just like those kids in the movie to feel inspired that we can change. So that's how I want to end it is that I want you to feel like you have the knowledge and the drive to address this problem and not feel sad about it. Sure, it sucks, but it's also a great opportunity to actually be able to change the world in a meaningful way.